This is Alfred's Alley, the oldest continuously inhabited street in America. On a taste of history, we have witnessed some spectacular sights. Met some very interesting people. Welcome to the governor's palace. Participated in some great battles. In case you're wondering about a smoke, we just fought one battle, let me tell you. We have traveled to exotic locations to see where the luxury ingredients of the 18th century came from. Fantastic, fantastic. And even participated in the local culture. Childhood memories. This series is about recreating the sophisticated cuisine of 18th century America. To see how people like Jefferson, Washington, and the Madisons lived and dined. Recipes such as Jefferson's beef stuffed cabbage at Monticello, Washington's baked sturgeon at Mount Vernon, chicken soup at Colonial Williamsburg, and curried tofu with shrimp at Bartram's Gardens. All to give you a taste of history. I really can't believe this marks our 39th episode. Time has gone by so quickly, but yet we have so much more to show you in coming seasons. It's a good moment to look back and remember some of the amazing things we have already seen, starting with our visits to historic residences. Why don't we step into Mr. and Mrs. Powell's dining parlor? This is practically the only dining room in colonial America. And of course, the lower class had no separate room to eat in. In winter, they often ate in their basements, which was where they cooked, and it was the warmest room in the house. So this is where the magic happened. <laughs> oh, absolutely. George and Martha loved this room. They even got design ideas from the room. They liked this wallpaper, believe it or not. They had two rooms in Mount Vernon done in something similar. Did you know the general once read that green is the color that promotes appetite best. The first year that Washington was back at Mount Vernon after the presidency, we know that there were some 600 and some overnight guests. So you can just imagine the amount of food that that takes. Now, Walter, if you were dining here for dinner, one thing that would have surprised you, given the standards of the time, is that it was Dolly who sat at the head of the table, not James Madison. He recognized that this was her strength, being the hostess, directing the service, keeping the conversation going. And he just turned that role, the, the social side of Montpelier, he turned over to her. Words can I describe uh, my gratitude for you opening Monticello, and I'm so delighted to have spent a couple of days with you here and uh, firing up the stove. When I cooked in Thomas Jefferson's kitchen in Monticello, I prepared a cabbage pudding, which is a beef stuffed cabbage, one of his favorite dishes, and also one of mine. So what I'll do is I'll take cabbage. Now what I find works is the best is whether a European fork or any kind of fork, because you're gonna put this in the water, in and out, Fire's doing good. Let me show you this now. This is the, definitely one of the most uh, exciting moments when you go. So you take it and you peel it back. And you take it and you peel it back. And you take it and you peel it back. And this little, little bit more fire right there. Stick it back in the fire again. And you have to constantly go back and forth. The moment that the water blanches the leaf, then you can pull it back. For a moment, here we go. And you want to put it back in the water again. This is a very not easy thing. When I say this to you, you got to believe me that. And you need asbestos hands. So this should do it now. Basically, when it's at this stage of the game, I'll take it down, take a sharp paring knife. Now it becomes the reconstructive surgery. It's almost like a little uh, plastic surgery of a cabbage, if you will. So you put this back in here bring the leaf back the way the cabbage was grown. What an invention though, you think about that, uh, somebody had thought of that, because it makes the most gorgeous presentation. Take the, the cheesecloth, and now comes the world trick. You shave it back, 
into the actual size of the cabbage. You take kitchen twine and and now this fellow cabbage is ready to get into the water for, like I said, about an hour to an hour and a half at a very low boil. Drenched in lots of butter and parsley, just about like so. Many times you don't see me nibbling on the show, but I cannot resist that. Taste for the chef. I get many requests for this recipe, but cabbage is pretty tame compared to some of the other dishes I've prepared. I'm sure you would agree with me that it is not the most beautiful looking fish, right? It was such an honor to be allowed to cook in George and Mother Washington's kitchen in Mount Vernon. I made a baked stuffed sturgeon, a fish that was caught here on the Potomac River all the time. So right now we're going to clean this fish, which is not easy. We're going to take the head. Now this head will make a great soup. The bones are pretty strong. This is how the fish takes his food in. You want to be careful not to lose a finger. No different than you would debone any other fish. What I'm doing next, I'm doing a stuffing. I'm using crab meat. The crab could have been right here from the Potomac as well. I have some fresh, we call it meat de pain or breadcrumbs. Ideally, what you want to use is a fresh breadcrumb. I have uh, chives and I have parsley already chopped up in there. You can never put too much egg in it because it's gonna be baked in the oven. And a little bit of uh, Worcestershire sauce, just a bit. The salt, be careful, because the crab meat usually, that if you buy it already, already cooked, usually is uh, preserved in salt. A good amount of pepper, like about so. And then you wanna mix it up gently, just like that. I already prepared the sturgeon, but I'm gonna show you how it's done. You're going to cut a little pocket inside here. Take the stuffing and just put the stuffing into the opening. And you're going to get nice and firm. And now what I have, I have a variety of different root vegetables and also some onion. And what you want to do is you want to cut it ideally almost in the same square. I will take the fish and just place it. Now comes white wine, good amount of white wine. And we're going to have a little bit more salt on top, a little bit of pepper. And now, this great looking sturgeon, because it's so fatty and so firm, will take about a half an hour at like 375 to 400 degrees. I'm going to vinaigrette right over the fish. That is a dish that would have been served here in Mount Vernon. Sturgeon right here, wood vegetable. Beautiful, beautiful vinaigrette done with the citrus. What a fantastic meal. Right here at Mother and George Washington's Kitchen at the Mount Vernon Estate. Not only have the ingredients been exotic, so have the 18th century luminaries we've met. A small trick of the trade. It's like me making Burmanier. See, nobody knows. <laughs> Welcome, sir. I'm very happy to have you at my humble tea table. Welcome, sir. Welcome. And your kitchen is superb. Oh, by the thank way. you so much. It yes. matches my food. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. President. We are most honored to have you here, Mr. Stabe, and look forward to the grand preparations that you are making. Dolly Madison. And guess what, ice cream I'm turning? Cinnamon, one of your favorite, I'm told. I'm afraid you've been misinformed. My favorite ice cream is oyster. In a garden, one could derive, in addition to support for the body, support for the soul. General Washington is very desirable. It was Benjamin Franklin that introduced tofu to British North America by sending seeds and the letter and the procedures how to make it to none other than John Bartram. This is the finished product 
of the, the soy that's made into what you call it, like a cheese. If it wasn't for Benjamin Franklin, Americans would have not found out about tofu until much later, and I would have not had the opportunity to cook curried shrimp with tofu in Bartram's garden. If you have availability to an Asian market, take some Thai peppers, a little sesame oil into my spider. One point of advice is the, the longer you cook the peppers, the less heat you're going to get. When you cut them, the heat intensifies. The peppers are in there, now I have a little bit of garlic. And the onion I cut really coarse for this particular recipe. Ginger and lemongrass. We saute it all together like you see here. We want the onion into a crisp, we don't want to cook it all the way down, just like so. The shrimp will go in now. The shrimp will see a little bit. The most important ingredient of this whole recipe is obviously the curry. Most people always are surprised when they ask me about curry. They say, curry? Huh. The 18th century had curry recipes, tons of them. Why? Curry came over with the ships from the West Indies right into the fabric of Philadelphia. So when you look at books of Hannah Glaser, which was written in 1745, you maybe have 20, 30 different curry recipes in there. So curry was a very dominant dish. A little bit of salt, a little bit of white pepper. Now you want to glaze with some white wine. Make sure a dry white wine would work. Don't use a, a Pinot Grigio or some one of those wines. Dry white wine will do it. If you're on a diet and you worry about calories, you do not have to use cream. I have to like cream because it just gets a certain flavor into it. Heavy cream, how can you go wrong with that? <laughs> Heavy cream, a little bit of cream. A little bit more cream in here. A little bit of cream. And cream. Oh yeah. Heavy cream. The better the cream, the better the dish. We're not counting calories, it's all about flavor. It's all about the 18th century. And it's all about the taste of history. Bok choy, one of my favorite vegetables. Now this happens to be a baby bok choy, just what you like for this recipe. And I leave all the stems in it. This makes it really, really perfect. So you're going to just cut it like this particular one in fourths, like that. Once the bok choy is wilted, which takes only a couple of minutes, the box, and then you want to cut up the tofu in a big, generous dice. Look at that. Because uh, it will fall apart quickly. You know, in the taste of history, I do a lot of research, and many of the recipes I recreate. This is one of those recipes that I could not believe the completion of it when I made this recipe, which was written by Hannah Klaasen in her book in 1745. And it's a sauce that is given to the sea captains as a flavoring, and this sauce is designed to be lasting for 20 years, mind you. It has ale, it has uh, anchovies, it has maize, it has pepper, it has uh, mushrooms and it's spectacular. So once you make it at home someday, you will never be without the uh, 18th century ketchup. <laughs> that sauce is very potent, has a tremendous amount of flavor, so very little will be put in there. I'm ready to serve up this fantastic dish. So don't be surprised for one moment about this dish as a tribute to John Bartram. Without him and Ben Franklin sent it to him, I don't know when we would have had uh, tofu in this country. One of my favorite places to visit wherever we go are vegetable gardens, where nature does its magic to produce ingredients for me. John Bartram was a Quaker farmer who came here in 1728. He began gathering interesting plants here, things that he called curious, which in his days meant scientific. Probably Bartram was one of the first people to ever grow soybeans in America. And when Franklin sent them, he also sent a recipe for how to make tofu that someone had smuggled out of China. We know in 1793 that Jefferson probably lived across the river for the summer. Jefferson sort of counted on William Bartram as one of the experts on American plants. Maybe this was his garden away from home. When he's in Philadelphia, he could come experience a garden without the actual work. Though I am an old man, I am ever but a young gardener. It's so great to be here in this lovely garden. And I think it's American in all these different ways. It was really an experimental garden. Mm -hmm. Jefferson uh, uh, was sort of a seedy missionary of the plant world. He said that the greatest service which can be rendered any country is to add a useful plant to its culture. 
and this garden became sort of a Ellis Island of new and unusual plants that came from around the world and it was revolutionary because one wonders if any man had grown so many different vegetables in one place before. So it's nice to fall back upon Jefferson's balanced belief in that relationship between uh, the garden and nature. Oh, he is a farmer, remember. This is a wonderful example of a formal English kitchen garden. A lot of geometrically designed beds and a lot of classic English horticultural uh, practices being used within this garden. If I was a plant, I would love it and I would actually be going here. So much exposure to the sunlight is spectacular. I'm here in the Winter Garden to really show you how innovative they were in the 18th century. People of means had fresh green vegetable throughout the entire winter season. This frame is what people today would call a, a cold frame. Just relies on the heat of the sun, the insulation value of the box itself. We'll have peas trained along the back, and we'll be picking peas by the middle of April, which is a great luxury in the 18th century. When I was in Williamsburg, we visited the Winter Garden, where I picked up some carrots for my spectacular chicken soup. Baba, are you ready for the task at hand? I certainly am. Look at this beautiful chicken we have here. So if you want to do me a favor and yeah. put this fellow in his water. Now, Baba, I have a whole bunch of uh, wood vegetables and stuff that I used from before the trimmings. Anything kind of that's, uh, that's available that you have laying around fits right in there. Here we go. You and wanna... of course, you've got some nice carrots from the garden. Right here, from your garden, yeah. A little bit of, I like a little sprig of thyme in it, not much more than that, and a bay leaf in there. And if you will throw this into the chicken. I certainly can. Thank you. And I'm going to push the crane closer yep. so that they boil. Perfect. I've already made the pasta dough, which is real simple, and everybody knows. All purpose flour, eggs, a little bit of oil. Mine, I put no water in at all. It's just the, the, the liquid of the egg binds us. Would you like me to roll it for uh, you? Exactly. That's what Certainly. I was thinking about. While you roll, I cut the other ones I already pre-made. How is that? Sure. Here you go. No problem. And then, what we'll do is, I'm going to get the chicken over that I've, we have in the other pot, and let you take out the chicken. This smells <laughs> absolutely... <laughs> well, how can you go on? All these beautiful root vegetables we put into it. All the goodness in there is spectacular. It doesn't get much better than that. The wood vegetables are perfect, as you see, and what a flavor your lot has. I mean, take a look at that. We put the chicken in here, put the stock on top. Yep, perfect. Now we're going to put this little bag on the fire, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the vermicelli right into the boiling water, and then, Bob, you want to put this back on the, the highest heat you can give me. A couple of minutes' time. While you get the soup, I'll reach the vermicelli. Now the big thing I want you to do is taste it for salt and pepper because the only thing we haven't done yet. I'll be tasting too a little bit. Let me see. Oh, ah. that tastes good even without salt and pepper in. Good, isn't the word for that? <laughs> that is fantastic. You want to ladle this in here for me, and then we'll stop it off with the stock. Just getting the the vermicelli out of the the pot. I have some parsley chopped, a little bit of parsley, and a couple of spring onions or green onions, like so. Put it on top there, and this is how it would be served. The flavor is just spectacular. I mean, it's like, it's just spectacular. Spectacular, spectacular. It's absolutely spectacular. Spectacular, just spectacular. Oh, spectacular. Oh, words cannot describe it. That is spectacular. There's something very special about my relationship to animals. They must know I'm sizing them up for dinner. <laughs> what kind of sheep do we have here? These are an English breed of sheep called Lester Longwool. <laughs> so Lester Longwool was developed in the 18th century to produce meat. This is a fighting cock and uh, cock fighting, having two roosters fight was an extremely popular sport in the 18th century, second only to horse racing. Everybody went to the cockfights at least once in their life. <laughs> he picked me. Since America didn't have any donkeys, Washington asked the King of Spain, Charles III, for one of his prized Andalusian jacks, and in 1785 sent royal gift 
to Mount Vernon. For about six months or so, he would not breed with the mares here. So the Marquis de Lafayette sent two female donkeys, and when they arrived, royal gift. Leave it to the French. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> In the new colonial city of New York, pigs were a big problem. They roamed the streets in rampaging herds and ate the farmers' crops. They erected a wall to ensure that the pigs stay out. The street along the barrier became known as Wall Street. No. Oh. Stay there, buddy. <laughs> One of my favorite spots I ever got to cook is Washington's Crossing, where I prepared pepper pot for George Washington and his troops. The same soup that the Continental soldiers celebrated with after defeating the Hessians. Oh, state your business, sir. General, you may let him pass. I'm here to prepare you the finest meal you've ever had. Food? <laughs> yes, of course. Ah, uh, well, that's wonderful. My troops haven't eaten in days. Actually, uh, today I'm making a dish that uh, is closer to my heart. It's a West Indian pepper pot soup. This is beef and pork that has been marinated in kosher salt. Got it. Perfect. True tradition of the 18th century, I take the schmaltz. In the short time that I put this in together, it's already, it's already getting hot. No smoke and mirrors. The meat already has less liquid because it was salt cured, but it still has some liquid in it. This is a taro root. This is full of starch. So Bill's gonna cut this one down. Garlic, rough cut. Then goes the uh, onion. Put a couple of bay leaves in there. You can add neck bones, beef knuckles, anything you want to put into it would be a good time to enhance the stock. So I'm gonna have some pork knuckles in here. We do not have scallion available like you have in the West Indies. Green onion is not quite the same, but it will do for today. Once the taro goes in, then I'm gonna start adding water. The taro just gets a little bit of a sweat. They would have used, obviously, water from the river. So the time goes in here now. The flavor is spectacular. The soup is uh, ready to receive the callaloo or the collards in this particular scenario. The general likes it hot. Your dinner is served, sir. Excellent. I'm gonna give you the first one. Have the troops assemble? Yes, sir. Here you go, general. Oh, delicious. Delicious, excellent. Like the old days? Yes. To the revolution. revolution. I raise a toast to you, our viewers. I live for this, to bring the splendor of 18th century cuisine to life. Here's to many more seasons to come. Hussar. Let the fun begin. If I was a plant, I would love it. I would actually be going here. Not for me, man. Oh. Mm -hmm. Cooking in the 18th century was hard work. Done. So step back with me to 18th century America and savor the great flavors and the taste of history.